Hello, everyone. <laughs> Good evening. I'm, <laughs> I'm Susan Call, and I'm the events advisor here at Politics and Prose. And on behalf of our owners and our entire staff, it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. Before we get started, a few familiar housekeeping items. I think I recognize everyone, and they, <laughs> oh, hi. Um, and they know the housekeeping items, but um, please uh, remember to silence your cell phones. And during the Q&A, we have a microphone right over here. If you could step up to it, we are recording this event. We have books behind the register, and there'll be a signing right here following the event. And if you don't mind helping us by folding up your chairs and leaning them against something, we would be grateful. And also, our holiday guide is out, so be sure to pick up a copy, and this is a good time to start doing your holiday shopping. Also, we've got great events still uh, through the rest of November, and we've already got some events scheduled in the new year, so be sure to take a look at our website. And now I'm thrilled to welcome Lisa Gornick back to Politics and Prose to talk about her luminous new novel, Anna Turns, which is her fifth work of fiction. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you too much about the book right now, other than that it's engrossing and a great read and that you're going to want to buy many copies to give as holiday gifts. Kirkus has called it engaging and introspective. And uh, we're going to talk much more about the book when we're in conversation in a few minutes. Uh, Lisa has been hailed by NPR as one of the most perceptive, compassionate writers of fiction in America. In addition to her books, her essays have appeared widely, including in the New York Times, the Paris Review, Real Simple, and the Wall Street Journal. She's a graduate of the Yale Clinical Psychology Program and the Psychoanalytic Training Program at Columbia. And uh, we're going to begin with a reading by Lisa, and then uh, I will be in conversation with her. So uh, let's begin, and please help me give a warm welcome to Lisa Gornick. Thank you, Susan. Can everyone hear me? Uh, OK. And thank you, cozy audience, for coming <laughs> today and out uh, on this fall night. And thank you, Politics and Prose, for hosting me. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the book before I do a short reading. Anna turns and spools over the 24 hours of a woman's 60th birthday as she wends her way through Manhattan. Yoga class with her quarreling nieces, the Met with her transitioning adult child, the Harlem brownstone of her gonzo journalist lover, Central Park with her pot-addicted doctor husband, dinner at a louche venue arranged by her self-made brother. Told in alternating chapters by Anna and other people important to her, we learn about her past and present dilemmas from her point of view and then enlarged by the overlay of their stories, some known to her, some not. I'm going to read the opening few pages which take place at midnight in Anna's study and then jump ahead to midday in the lobby of the Met. The second hand on the Museum of Modern Art desk clock arrives at the 12 to align with the minute and hour arrows so that for an instant the three form a vector pointed heavenward, shepherding in my 60th birthday. The clock was a rare gift from my father Rolf, dead this past year, who never remembered my birthday. My mother Jean never forgets. Of late, she's memorialized the day with an email sent at midnight. More cyber attack, italicized and bolded fonts, hyperlinks, capitalized text than hallmark sentiments. Now my mother's latest birthday email sits atop my inbox with calculations as the subject. Can I delete it unopened? For God's sake, I'm 60 years old. Am I not the sentry for my own mind? I open it. Anna, colon, on your 60th birthday, it seems appropriate to share the following, all caps, calculations that I made 20 years ago regarding the inflation adjusted sum of money I spent on you. <laughs> One, people never realize how, all caps, very costly it is to raise a child. Two, 
If this information were more widely available, the birth rate would undoubtedly be lower and our economy more prosperous. Three, I plan to write a letter to the New York Times on this subject. Four, 20 years ago, the number I calculated for the amount I spent raising you was $56,000. Had I invested that amount starting at your birth rather than spending it year by year on you, it would have grown with compound interest to nearly, all caps, a quarter of a million dollars. All of which is to say, being a parent is a great sacrifice. Mom slash Jean. I bury my head in my arms, the words detonating, my adult self imploding. No, I tell myself. No, no, and no. I'm seated on the lobby's circular bench, absorbed in Clarissa Dalloway's response to Lady Bruton having invited Clarissa's husband, but not her, to luncheon when Simon kisses my cheek. Happy birthday, Mom. The changes in Simon from the feminizing therapy have been gradual, but slowly a ravine has widened between the person who announced last October they know in their soul they're a woman and the graceful creature standing in front of me in a turtleneck sweater with brows that look like they've been plucked and a chin with no sign of stubble. By the end of summer, they've told me they'll change their name to Simona and begin using female pronouns. With this news have come new worries. Will Simona be safe? What if she's in an accident and the ambulance crew cut off her clothes and discover she's trans? What if one of them is transphobic? Will they still help her? Simon takes my arm as I stand. Sorry I'm late. Inga forgot I was taking you to lunch and scheduled a meeting with the series editor. They roll their eyes. I had to attend. While we walk through the Greek and Roman galleries to the restaurant, Simon tells me Inga now wants to incorporate debates about consciousness into her book on legal questions raised by reproductive technologies. I listen, letting my eyes wander over the marble statues for centuries considered the embodiment of an Aryan ideal when in fact they'd originally been painted in a range of skin tones. Never before have I noticed the sheer quantity of male genitals in the galleries depicted so sweetly and flower-like, smelling of stone, not man. I inhale deeply. We can only be as happy as our least happy child, Fiona is fond of saying. For both of us, our least happy child is our only child. With Simon, though, the saying isn't apt. Since declaring their intention to transition, Simon is not unhappy. Like Clarissa Dalloway's daughter, who sees the horizon as infinite, she might be a doctor, a farmer, go into parliament, or she might be indolent and do none of the above. My child is excited about the changes ahead. Simon pauses at a terracotta statue of a woman seated on a boulder. Belief, they've explained, has nothing to do with their experience. They don't believe they're a woman. They are a woman. What's most challenging for me is what I know in my bones. I must not turn a deaf ear to the essential difference between believe, which presumes other possibilities, and is or are with their full, transitive, equal sign, non-disputable force. I must not say anything that implies I understand who you are more than you do yourself. Thank you. see yes it's on is this on yeah and this yeah. everyone can hear yeah good well that was lovely and thank you Susan um, a good uh, segue to my first question which is in fact about mrs. Dalloway and about the idea of setting a novel in one day and getting a glimpse of an entire life through a day so it's sort of a two-part question of where did the mrs. Dalloway did you set out to mirror that, or how did how did you make that decision? 
Well, my my last novel, The Peacock Feast, took place over a hundred years, <laughs> and <laughs> that was pretty daunting. My protagonist was, in fact, 101, and it tells the entire story of her life and her extended family. So I was very interested in writing a, sh a, a shorter f time frame. And I do love Mrs. Dalloway. I think it's a brilliant book. It's been very important to me. But I, I also love what I call tight frame novels, which are novels that take place in a constricted time. So there's a couple of favorites that I have. I love Remains of the Day by Kazuo Ishiguro, which takes place essentially in a week. But like Mrs. Dalloway, tells the entire story, really, of the, the context of this of this butler and, and a great deal of history. And Mrs. Dalloway manages in that day for us to understand all the, or many of the important emotional events in Clarissa Dalloway's life. Um, very early on, we immediately slide back to when she was 18 in the country house and and she meets the man that she doesn't marry, and they have a fight in, in the garden over cauliflower and other things. And so, with my with Anna Turns, I wanted to try to do this uh, something similar, which was to not feel like there was front story and back story, but rather to include enough of the emotional context of Anna's life that it enriches the front story, but the reader feels hopefully as absorbed in what's happening in the past as they are in the present. It, it, I was trying to not have flashbacks. And so uh, another tight frame novel that I admire and, and love a great deal is Crossing to Safety by Wallace Stegner. And he does something similar that takes place over 48 hours or 72 hours. Very important moment in these characters' lives, but we really learn the history of these of these two couples, both of whom are probably in their 60s at that point. So that's, that's what my goal was. <laughs> and you're such a perceptive writer, and you really bring all of these various points of view, feel very honest. And I wonder about your background as a psychoanalyst and how, how you feel that influences your writing. Oh, well, thank you for asking that. And I have two analyst colleagues yeah. here, so <laughs> you can pitch in on that. Um, I think that being uh, an analyst, first of all, when I began writing, it was all about character development. And I felt that I needed to know my characters as deeply as I knew my patients. I was still in practice at the time. I'm not any longer, as I knew intimates in my life uh, before I could set them loose. So I would do what felt like a lot of pre-writing, even though I was writing scenes and I was writing character studies, but in, I didn't really feel like I started the book until they were really clear in my mind. Now, a lot of writers don't work that way. A lot of writers um, who I admire a great deal learn about their characters through the writing. It's just a different process. But um, part of the way, th and there's a parallel for therapists too. There are some therapists who, the moment that the patient walks in, the treatment begins and they start. And that's a very legitimate way to work. I was trained in this traditional way because I interned in hospitals where you had a consult, you had a long consultation with a with a patient, and then we would write up a case study. And the sort of the during that time, it was a different process. So you would be asking the patient direct, uh, in a much more directive way, a lot of questions to get a lot of background. And then at the end of that, we had to give a recommendation you know, to the whole treatment team. This was for hospital psychiatry. And then you would embark on, on the treatment. And in a way, I sort of do that with my books, too. I have this kind of pre-period. But what's very interesting is that the story that emerges in that initial time frame is always wrong. <laughs> It's never, it's it's never really what's going on. But it's it's invaluable I information to have. It's very important information because you just might never have learned that, you know, the patient had a 
cousin who died of appendicitis when they were three, or you know, or the mo or you might not learn otherwise, you know, that the mother had a psychiatric hospitalization. Or there's a lot of important information, but the story that the patient tells and that the therapist then constructs, which are often not the same they're usually missing really important things, and that's the same for me with my, um, with my novel writing. So I may start off thinking that, okay, I think I see where this book may go, and it never <laughs> ends up doing yeah. that. And I rarely look, I, in fact, not rarely, never look at those notes again. <laughs> Except if I've worked out some kind of timeline, then we, we're just talking about timelines. If I've worked out some kind of timeline, I might later check to make sure that I've got that all straight. But well, I hadn't planned to ask you this, but hearing you talk, I wonder, were you already a novelist while you were practicing, or did you become a novelist after? Well, I started by writing short stories, which a lot of fiction writers do, and I was simultaneously um, uh, a psych fellow when I started uh, my MFA, what was essentially an MFA program at NYU. And while I was there, Yale Doctorow was my advisor, and I was bringing in story after story at one point, and he, was, he brought me in, and he said, this has got to be so exhausting for you. <laughs> he said, you're inventing like nine fictional worlds a year. Why don't you write a novel? And I looked at him, I said, well, because I don't know anything about how to write a novel. I know how to write short stories. And he said, well, I think you better just write a novel <laughs> because your stories are starting to burst at the seams anyway. So then I had to go about figuring out how to write a novel, which I'm still figuring out. Do you know how to do it, Susan? <laughs> no, I don't know. Paul, do you know how to do it? <laughs> Anybody here, please tell me. <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, that's a great uh, encouragement to have that coming from him. <laughs> Um, I'm still not sure how to even ask this question because the answer seems so obvious, and yet there's something about your work, not just this book, but your stories, Louisa Meets Bear. There's something so quintessentially New York about your work that I think if you strip that out, it would be an entirely different story. And on the one hand, that's like obvious, but I wonder if there's more to it about the sort of DNA of New York in your work? Well, it, maybe it connects to what we were talking about, uh, uh, about building character. Uh, part of what I need to do, and this may seem quite obsessive, but I really can't write until I can visualize where my characters live. So I end up drawing floor plans, and I actually picked the building where Anna lives. It's a very specific building that, that I know, and I studied all the floor plans. And then I did a renovation in my mind of the apartment <laughs> because her father is an architect, and he's renovated this apartment. So I really had to know how he had renovated this apartment. And it, it was very important for understanding him. He's a character in it and understanding how Anna lives. So. I, I have to be grounded in a place in order to write, and I know New York well, so that's where I write about. And, yeah. But I grew up in Catonsville, and so part of this book is set also in Baltimore. Um, that's where Anna grows up, and that's where her, her mother um, brings her to live when she's five. Yeah, it's almost more than the setting, though. There's something almost about the DNA of the book, of the walking and the park and the museums. And well, that's true. So um, I was telling you this before. I There's a, a saying that I love that Lauren Groff has, which she says about her characters, they're not not me. And uh, so um, I absolutely invented this story and these characters uh, and what happens in the book, but it wasn't really until I was done that I realized that the consciousness in the book of Anna is very much, I share her consciousness. So, so, so the, the biographical part is the, sen is the sensibility. And when you live in, I've lived in New York now for 30 years, I moved in when I was eight months pregnant with my first child, which was a strange thing to do, but I had this terror of becoming a suburban mom. I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? And I just didn't want to be lifting the baby in and out of car seats and all that. So I've spent a long time, and it's very much um, 
framed my life and the way I, I think about families and, and so on. So I think I realized that with Louisa Meets Bear, when I put that collection together that was made, that was made up of stories I'd written over time, that the, what threaded those together also was that the characters had this sort of shared sensibility that evolved, though, in that, in that book um, over like 40 years. And yeah, you have a little bit of, of that in this book as well, a lot of seemingly unrelated story th lines that come together and some heavy themes in here too. Like let's talk about, she's had, Anna's had a, is having a seven year long affair with a journalist and you get into this uh, thread about the Buddhas. Can you talk about that a little bit? Okay, so um, Anna, is married to a really wonderful man and when she so this is a digression to get there yeah. and so when they meet she's in graduate school in in english and he is uh, a resident at the hospital university of pennsylvania and he comes over to her and he sees that she's very uncomfortable at a party and he says i can tell you're not a beer drinker and it turns out it's really his apartment where this party is being held, and he offers to make her orange juice. And no one has ever made her orange juice before. Her mother used to serve her this awful, bitter, frozen concentrate. And then he says, tell me about yourself, which no one has really ever asked her before either. And he's a very kind, wonderful man, and they, um, Nine years before the book starts, they're on a trip to Switzerland. Her father grew up in a hotel um, outside of Silsberia, where his father was the general manager of that hotel. And so he grows up on the grounds of this hotel. And they're visiting that place. And her husband has a slip. He slips while they're hiking. And he ends up with a serious back injury. And he's an anesthesiologist. And like happens with a lot of medical doctors, he has way too much access to opiates, and he gets addicted to painkillers. But he's um, smart enough and prudent enough to realize that this is going to be really bad if he lets this go too far. So he take he weans himself off the opiates by um, by taking up vaping marijuana as his as his method of pain management, which allows him to function still as a doctor. Um, and doesn't bring their life into catastrophe, but it's at the expense of their sex life. So they've had no sex for seven years, even though they have a very warm um, and loving relationship. And she has been, she's a museum goer, and she's at the Rubin Museum downtown one day when this man approaches her, who sees her looking at this tiny little Buddha, and they end up having a tea together, and it turns out that he's a journalist, and he's been working, he's working on a book about the dynamiting of the Bamiyan Buddhas, and I don't know if anyone else is familiar with that story, but in March of 2001, uh, Mullah Muhammad Omar, a Taliban leader, um, ordered the destruction of these sixth century Buddhist statues that are enormous. They're, one of them is 125 feet and one's 150 feet and they're built into the cliffs and there was a brief his time in Afghanistan when Buddhism came to Afghanistan and it no longer is there and these statues are important tourist attractions but they have no meaning to the local people who are Muslim. They don't, they're not uh, religious icons for them in any kind of way. So the dynamiting, he's Lance, this man, has been writing about this to try to understand why would they, why did this happen? And he's interviewed various people, inclu and including the, the Taliban leaders who were close to the person who ordered this destruction. And what he's learned is that the reason was that the leader was really outraged because uh, international aid organizations wanted to restore the Buddhas, which had become in great disrepair, and he wanted them to instead give the money to local people, to give the money because there was a lot of starvation for schools, for food, and when they wouldn't, as an act of protest, because he thought it was inhumane that they were going to, they cared about these Buddhas more than the people, he destroys them. So Lance, this 
journalist is very absorbed in this question of how can you tell a story about someone when the this was considered an incredibly monstrous act at the time. They destroyed these, and, and it's called a senseless act too because it didn't bring a grain of rice to any starving child. And yet Lance has this conviction that there's never a senseless act. There's always a reason. We just have to understand what it is. And so he's trying to make this distinction between understanding and condoning. He doesn't condone this, but he wants to help explain it because he thinks it's important. And in a way, that becomes a theme throughout the book, which is the distinction between seeing things through other points of view, turning away from oneself to another point of view without having to condone it, without having to approve of it, but making a commitment to try to understand. So this is quite radical, and, and Lance really needs to know that Anna gets that, and she does. And that's sort of the genesis of their, of their affair. And he has very idiosyncratic views about marriage, too. And that's part of what, which she never fully accepts, though she does understand his point of view. And yeah, that's an, another area without any spoilers here, but that's where your psychoanalytic brain seems to uh, come through in the end with the epiphany that Anna has about acceptance of sorts. Is that the right way to say that? I think so. I think so. And uh, Lance has a, um, a marriage that he's completely committed to, to a woman named Alice who's a pediatrician and runs a clinic in Harlem, is very involved in her work, and he's completely committed to, he's in a sense the stay-at-home parent with their kids, to their being a family, but he has never felt that the deal meant monogamy. And there's a, a kind of arrangement between Alice and him about this, it's not very explicit, but the way that he explains it to Anna is that he has these areas of his life that Alice really just can't participate in. He's a surfer, he's an avid traveler, and that this is just something else that is just not part of his, of his life with Alice. Uh, now, Anna never can, is never at peace with that arrangement, but at the same time, um, she's involved with this this uh, quite passionate affair with him. And, and you make a pretty bold choice to tell the story from her point of view, the wife's point of view, in one in one snippet. So the book um, has is told from Anna's point of view in first person. That's like the spine of the story. So we start at midnight. I read you that part, and it ends at midnight uh, on her birthday. But tucked in are five chapters from other points of view. And so we turn away from Anna to, s to see the story through some other points of view. One is her husband, one is her father, one is her brother, who's been, uh, from Anna's point of view, quite cruel to her. But I think we sort of understand in a slightly different way when we, we see his point of view. And one is her lover, Lance, and then one is Lance's wife, Alice. So those are the five other stories that are tucked in there. So your, your title's doing kind of double duty there, yeah, metaphorically. It does. Because <laughs> it's the birthday and then Anna turning. Um, Anna's a book doula, which I'd never heard that before. Um, can you talk about that in her kind of, it felt very familiar to me as someone who has no boundaries with my writing students. <laughs> it's like, call me <laughs> any time to ask me any question, and she's a bit like that. Can you talk about that? Well, yeah, no, my editor came up with that word, book doula. The doula, that's never actually in the book. Uh, she calls herself a psychological editor. Her best friend calls her a manuscript therapist, and she says, no, I'm not a therapist. <laughs> and, uh, but she has, um, dropped out of graduate school, or she's left without a dissertation. So she's studied English, and she's a very serious reader. And then she goes and she works as the assistant for a screen agent for a period of time. And then she decides to go to social work school. 
but she gets pregnant with her child um, while she's in social work school. So instead of going right out to get a job, she decides to delay. She'll wait, you know, a, a few months until after her, she's been home with the baby a year or so. And while she's in her last two months of pregnancy, her friend Fiona s comes to her and says, could you help my friend blah -de blah with um, her novel? She needs, she needs help. She needs basically an independent editor. And Anna says to her, well, I'm not an editor. You know, you need to get her an editor. And she says, don't be ridiculous. You can absolutely do this. You know about stories, and you know about how to help people from social work school, and you can do it. So what happens is that in this consultation that she has with this first client of hers, um, she immediately perceives that what the woman is trying to do in her novel is to tell the story and then muzzle herself so she's not telling the story. So she's doing both at the same time. And she's afraid to tell the story. She's afraid that it will insult her parents, that it, she has just a lot of fears. So that's essentially what Anna does with her clients, is that she tries to help them see the way that they are holding themselves back because of their internal conflicts from writing what they, they want to write. And so she calls herself a psychological <coughs> editor, and uh, my editor called her a book doula, which I think <laughs> is kind of cool. And uh, Yeah, that's a good, a good term. I'm going to steal that, I think. Um, so you're not afraid to shy away from some heavy themes in this book. Um, you know, from the Taliban, but also to the son who's going through a big life change. And I think one thing you do very beautifully is the you write honestly about the mother's conflict. You don't sort of take the easy, the easy route on that. And I wonder how you chose to write about the son transitioning and how you went about sort of learning more about that. Well, like probably everyone in the room, I have friends whose um, kids are either non-binary or transitioning, so I've been the confidant of people who are attempting to uh, be good parents and adjust and understand their kids. Um, I read and listened to a lot of memoirs by uh, um, trans women and about their fam what happened and unfolded in their families. And then ultimately, I came to understand that it wasn't really all that different from what almost every parent with an adult child goes through, which is that there's a point where you have to understand that your child's body no longer belongs to you. Anna has a moment when she thinks about Simon, um, who at this point is identifying, is using they pronouns. Uh, not, but but will eventually be using she pronouns, and thinks that she used to know, you know, every freckle and every scab on their body, and you know, she used to bathe them, and and that it is no longer that part of their of her child is is no longer um, accessible to her, and that like every parent, she has to let go. I think I read this. Um, this piece in the in the section which she says you, you can't she can no longer say I know you better than you know yourself and so I felt like I came to that understanding that this may be a, um, a more dramatic situation for parents but it's not fundamentally different we're gonna open up to questions in, in just a minute or two so start thinking of your questions um, but I wanted what was I just going to ask you? My question is escaping me here. Give me one second. I had a good had Okay, a well, good you can question. think about it. And while <laughs> you do this, you, asked, you said about the title. I was very delighted that there's a visual joke in the cover. It turns upside down and works oh, <laughs> either way. Huh, the, profile, the profile <laughs> exists upside down and forward, so I was quite pleased with the <laughs> illustrator when they came up with that. And <laughs> okay, I remember my question. I was going to ask you, this is fiction, clearly, but we were talking a little bit before about the line between fiction and memoir and how 
somebody you know said your aunt in fact Great. said to Sigrid Nunez um, I started asking her questions about the dog from the friend from the friend so um, and you were talking about the consciousness seeping right. through so we are live streaming we we do have family mm -hmm. watching right. perhaps but I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit well this is definitely a work of fiction and I feel much freer writing fiction than I've never written memoir. I've written a few personal essays. Uh, but as I said, the while the characters are invented, the situation is invented, uh, the consciousness I, is very much my, my own. But that said, I don't always write in my own consciousness. And the other chapters the, that are tucked in are absolutely invented consciousness. So four of them are male characters, and one of them is her husband, who is a quite different character structure than she is. One is her brother, who's a um, very successful self-made consultant in the area of finance, but um, has been wounded, has a kind of wounded persona to him. One is her, her philandering father, that's actually written, he's no longer with her, he's dead at that point, and, and one is her lover, and then her lover's wife. So I very much enjoy writing from other perspectives, but it is, but I am, I was aware only after I finished the book that the consciousness of Anna was, was close to my, to my own, but I was glad to be able to move out of it too, and well, you do an amazing job of the family dynamics. There's like so many threads of this novel of the brother who's kind of hijacked the the will right. of the father, and yeah, you've just got a lot of things that feel very real. Yes. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah. Would you? Oh, yeah. And you might don't mind going to the mic. Hi, hi, hi Laura. <laughs> Oh, you talked about uh, your initial plan and how it never ended up that way. So can you talk a little bit about your process and um, what surprised you as things changed? Like, were there any particular things where you, you never saw that coming? And Okay. So um, the first version of this book was only in Anna's point of view, and it was a little shy of 200 pages. It was a very tight novel, and my agent loved it and sent it out, and meanwhile, I was working on these stories that I thought were kind of outtakes from the novel, a little bit like Anything is Possible is to my name is Lucy Barton, and I was sh sharing them with a, a friend who knew the novel well, actually the novelist uh, Alice Dark, who's wonderful writer and in the process of talking about this I began to realize why was I considering this a second book why didn't I put them together and I, I took the book out of submission and said I need to fold these together so that was and and oh by the way it'll take me about two years to do that so um, so I began to do that and as happens with these sorts of processes sometimes you go overboard and I went way overboard and I ended up with a manuscript that was 450 pages <laughs> and I had jumped forward four years and there were now seven other points of view and <laughs> a couple of my wonderful writer friends read this and said yeah it's great to fold these other stories in but you two of them are too extraneous and you need to go back to the one day so I took a big gulp, <laughs> and I, you know, walked around, walked around like for a long time, and thought about it, and it rang true to me. And not every reader said this, but that rang true. I had some readers who really liked that jump for it, but it rang true to me. And so, what was interesting was that what I had learned in writing the next four years, it was like stone soup, where you don't need the stone in the soup. I didn't need the four years. But I, what I learned about the characters and through all these other stories, I was able to fold and weave into the, uh, the next iteration of the book, which was sort of in between in length, the, the, the two iterations. And it became much denser, 
the book. It, it was as though all the threads had been pulled, the, the thematic connections were, were deeper, and that's how, that's how it landed. So I do not recommend that to anybody <laughs> yet. Well, no one here knows how to write a novel, so I think that's really the only way to do it. So. Did you have a question? No. No, I was okay. listening. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Anne. Hi, Lisa. That was really wonderful to listen to. I was, I mean, I guess I have two different thoughts. One was just listening to you talk about the process of getting to know the characters at the beginning, and then when you talk about them, I their backstories are incredibly rich and detailed, and you know the hotel of the grandfather. So I just thought that was a marvelous way of thinking about like the difference between what you that the um. You know, thinking about like what you learn in the evaluation of a patient, and but what you w really learn as you get to know, them. and right. that's sort of what you're sort of talking about with the characters. But what I was thinking about is the people who are the s the voices who are woven in. Um, three men, four men, four men, and a woman, maybe a, a you know a complicated relationship to a woman who doesn't know Anna as Anna. And so I was thinking about how such an interesting way to spotlight aspects of a character by people who are not necessarily the ones that she might have chosen to reflect who right. she is on her birthday. And so I just was curious to speak to that. Like, how do they capture her do, and how well or what do they pick up that she wouldn't necessarily know about herself or appreciate about herself or not? <laughs> I think that what happens in the book is, is that it's not so much what she doesn't know about herself, but what she doesn't know about them. So she really, there are things she doesn't know about her husband. There are things she does absolutely does not know about her father. And there's a scene, and it's interesting they talked about the hotel, there's a scene in which when her father is dying, um, Anna asks her husband, can you give my dad some pot because he's not eating? And she thinks that maybe if her husband gives him some marijuana and he vapes that maybe he'll be able to eat. It doesn't really work, but what, ha what does happen is that there's this interlude where her husband spends about an hour with her father very close to her father's last days. And the father tells the husband something that he's never told Anna and about his own father and what happened in that hotel. And so there, so there are bits of the story that the reader knows that would be illuminating to Anna about the context of her life. And there are, similarly, there's a story um, from about her lover and something important that's happened in his life that she doesn't know anything about. And of course, she really, she thinks a lot about Alice, who is the wife of her lover, but she doesn't know her. So um, that, that was the way that I was thinking about it because she's stuck in a certain way in some of her resentments and grievances, and it's as though the reader gets a little ahead of her so the reader is able to begin to see some of these other people a bit more empathically when we when we step outside of her point of view, and she, in some unconscious way, kind of catches up. And one thing we notably haven't talked about is the mother character yeah, here. How do we not do that? <laughs> you begin the book with mother, and you you end with the mother. And you wrote a really beautiful piece uh, that I read online about your own relationship with your mother. Not that this is the same mother, but since I don't know what the question is there, but maybe talk a little bit well, about her relationship with her mother in the yes, book. Yes, yeah. yes. So this is a mother who, um, someone else who interviewed me a couple days ago said, used the word exasperating, and she is really exasperating. <laughs> and, uh, um, but, this is part connected to what we were talking about, about the backstories, that it's it was through developing Jean, her mother's backstory, that I came to feel 
empathy for her. So Jean uh, grows up in in Baltimore with these parents who have met on a boat when they're 15. They've met on the boat from Rotterdam to New York and they've fallen in love as 15 years old. They marry the day, these are her grandparents, her maternal grandparents. They marry the day that they land in New York City and they spend their wedding night on a bench in Penn Station and then they take the train to Baltimore because the grandfather has an uncle who's going to put them up in his cellar with his pickle barrels. So they're immigrant family who have never seen, they never see their their own parents again after they're, they're 15. These are Jean's parents and she's very beautiful as a girl and she gets um, by chance sort of becomes a catalog model for a department store in Baltimore. And she's brought to New York City when she graduates from high school to be a catalog model. And it doesn't work out that well for her. She's sort of unwilling to do what you would have to do to become a, a, a model. She won't starve herself and she just doesn't. And actually what she wants to do is to study math. And so she doesn't do this. And she ends up marrying Anna's father who is this very promising architecture student. And all kinds of things happen. But as I began to think about her story and the kind of pluck and bravery that the mother had, I felt um, more compassion for her. And there's also a generational thing that for those of us who are of an older generation, we grew up kind of free range kids. I mean, parents didn't, there weren't cell phones. Your parents weren't involved in every little aspect of your life, right? You just, you, uh, I remember, nobody took me on college tours, I, you know? <laughs> You just w took the car and you went with your friends and you went to see colleges and it was just very, very, very different. And so this is what, you know, Jean, Anna's mother, she basically has the idea that like raising kids, what that means is you make sure that they're fed and housed and they survive to age 18, done. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, Anna, but at, on the other hand, she never exposes Anna to any kind of danger and Anna does survive till age 18 and, and goes on so um, the mother is very exasperating and for my analyst colleagues here she absolutely splits she gives you know she puts the brother on a uh, on a pedestal and sees him as all wonderful and she um, you know gives all of her hostility to uh, directs all of her hostility to Anna. So that's what happens. And we have another question. I think about the uh, number of books I've read uh, written by therapists that take place in Baltimore. And I was wondering what it is about Baltimore. Is it about the <laughs> academic uh, programs of therapy training or about the culture of Baltimore? That's a great oh, question. <laughs> that is a great question, absolutely. Well, um, another I saw another writer, um, Jane Delory, recently posted taking her students from the University of Baltimore writing program to see Gertrude Stein's house. And so um, there is that modernist background. And of course, Shepherd Pratt Hospital was, was here too. But Anna is, um, she doesn't identify as a psychotherapist, but Baltimore is a really interesting, complicated city. I don't know if I can, uh, did you have other therapists in mind who've written about Baltimore? Who? Tyler. Oh, yeah, that's right. Well, she was married to a psychiatrist, right? Right, and um, yeah, so that's a good example, Except, right. Interesting, any other questions? Do you want to talk about the coat story at all? <laughs> I was thinking I should have prompted you to, to read that. But, uh, oh. um, she has a very funny anecdote in the novel that I had to stop reading and call her <laughs> to say, I have a very similar coat story. But it kind of, it, it tells a lot about the mother. Okay. So you can just relate it. All right. So the mother, um, when she's about 84, uh, Anna and her brother decide to bring her 
to live in New York. So because they want to keep an eye on her as she's creeping towards 90 and they both live there, it will just be a lot easier. So they m move her to, um, to New York City and the I Anna has meantime come down to Baltimore on three different trips because there's this huge, not huge, I mean, there's a row house, but it's three generations that have lived there, the grandparents and Jean and then her, uh, Anna and her brother, and they have to clear it out and her mother's a pack rat. And so she's trying to make um, piles, you know, pack to break, donate, toss. And the mother basically wants to bring everything. She's trying to give it so you can't bring five queen size quilts to New York City, you know, in a in a post war apartment. It's just not going to fly. But anyway, when she arrives there, Jean arrives there. Um, Anna has presumed that because she's done all the packing and the sorting, that you know her brother will help unpack. <laughs> And he says, sure, as soon as we get back from our fire and ice vacation. <laughs> so fire and ice vacations are something that um, affluent New Yorkers take. It means that you go skiing, and then to recover from going skiing, you fly immediately to the Caribbean. <laughs> so when they get back from their fire and ice vacation, they'll be able to help. But meanwhile, Anna knows you can't leave an 84-year-old woman sitting there for a week unable to find her hearing aids or her glasses or her coffee pot or her blood pressure machine. So she has to unpack the, the house, and which means that her mother thinks that it's always her responsibility when she can't find anything for Anna to immediately come over and find it. And so on one of these trips, um, Anna is there in a snowstorm having trekked across Central Park to get to her. And her mother is complaining, she's so cold. She's so cold. And so Anna, and she fingers Anna's microfiber down coat and says, where did you get this coat? And so Anna tells her that where she got the coat and her mother says, I guess I'll have to go there. And she gets Anna to come with her and they get, they get there. And her mother looks at the racks of coats and says, these are all awful. I don't want any of these. <laughs> And Anna says, well, those are the same make as mine, that one that you said you wanted. I would never wear anything that ugly. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, they, um, they leave, and her mother gets the niece to take her to Macy's because she, um, she has decided that Saks, where Anna has taken her, is just you know, way too expensive, and she's not going to do it there. So at Macy's, they don't have the same coat. So she sets off on this journey of she is going to call the manufacturer of the coat that she sees at Macy's to see if there are any online reviews. So the manufacturer is like in Pakistan. <laughs> so it just goes on and on and she involves the family in layer after layer of these endless emails, sort of unable to understand that everybody has a life and they can't spend you know, many, many hours thinking about her coat. And she ultimately tells the salesperson that um, she'll buy the coat, but she wants to have a guarantee that she can return it. And they're, they're told, yes, you can return it. And she says, but I want to be able to return if it goes on sale. And I don't want to have to bring the coat back. I just want you to give me the lower price. And, and it just, she's just sort of unable, the mother, to be able to understand kind of the way the world works or how other people perceive her and <laughs> did yeah. I capture it? Yes, you okay. did. And it's uh, it's very funny and you should definitely buy the book for many reasons, <laughs> but that's one of them to actually read that. So, well, my last question, but hopefully anybody have any last audience questions? Um, sometimes I get sort of slapped for asking this, but um, are you working on anything now? Or do you have any? Well, I, you know, during the interstices of, you know, your book going out on submission and then so, you know, waiting for copy editing and so on. And over the last two years, I've been writing lots and lots of notes, doing what I call this pre-writing. And I probably have about 200 pages of tons of notes. And I feel like I know my characters now for the new book, but I haven't figured out yet the structure, which is what I'm obsessed with these days, of how I'm going to tell the story. I know I don't know exactly what will happen. I never worry anymore about what will happen. I know who the characters are, but I haven't figured out how I'm going to tell the story. And I think I'll have to get through the next month before I can 
really have a good talk with myself about that. <laughs> and, uh, do you still think about writing stories, or do, are you more engaged in the novel? I'm, I'm more engaged in the novel, but I am interested in, um, like in Louisa Meets Bear, in Link's stories that create a novel, and in the possibility of having some freestanding sections in, in a book. I do, I do like that idea. And, and, the, and some of the sections of this book work this, that way. They could be freestanding. And, yeah, this could have been and, linked stories in, in another way of thinking about exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. And well, we are going to have a little wine and cheese downstairs. So I hope everybody will join us afterwards and then we can chat more. Well, thank you. And <laughs> thank you.